Welcome to the Real Estate Secrets Podcast for healthcare professionals, hosted by Austin Hare and Nathan Palmer, who together have over two decades of real estate knowledge and investing. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the show. Today, we have a special guest, Howard Ferrand. No introduction is needed for him, but of course, he is the founder of the 30 Day MBA, the founder of Dental Town, the host of podcast Dentistry Uncensored, and has the best hair in the entire dental industry. So, <laughs> Howard, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time to come on and grace us with your presence today. My, my only reason for coming on the show is that by the end of the show, I know you'll want to shave your head and be bald the rest of your life just like me. So when you've reached that point, please stop me, Austin, and we'll, we'll, we'll call it a goal. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right. So we have one benchmark to shoot for and one benchmark alone. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. So um, you have been in the dental industry for a little bit longer than 10 minutes, it looks like. <laughs> and so I'm curious, you know, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to get into dental? I mean, you know, there's a whole big world out there. Um, what, how old were you when you decided you want to do that? And what circumstances in your life kind of led to that? You know, I, I have to blame the whole thing, whether he wants to take credit for it or not, it was my next door neighbor was Kenny Anderson. My dad, do they, you're down in uh, Orlando. Do they have Sonic drive-ins down there? Yeah, I'm from South Carolina and they're a lot more popular in South Carolina, but I want to say I've driven past a couple down here. Yeah, well, my dad bought the first Sonic drive-in franchise in Wichita, Kansas when I was 10 years old. And he um, delivered, he married my mom. They had seven kids. They uh, wow. didn't make any money, he made $11,000 a year delivering rainbow bread. And he saved up his money and he bought one of these new franchises. He couldn't afford a McDonald's or a Pizza Hut or anything like that. Um, even Taco Bells were completely out of the top. But he saved up his money, bought a Sonic drive-in franchise when I was 10. And, and it, it was crazy. He went from making 11000 a year to 60000 a year. And by the time he bought, he built one a year for nine years. And by the time he got to five, we moved out from the poorest part of Wichita down by 21st and Hill Street on Rutan to Hidden Lakes Estates. And my next door neighbor was Kenny Anderson, the valedictorian of his class at Creighton University. He just celebrated his 50 year anniversary doing dentistry two years ago. And I would go to work with my dad, who was the absolute love of my life, the greatest man I ever met. And, uh, but we made hamburgers and cheeseburgers. I mean, I loved eating chili dogs. I loved onion rings. I loved chocolate shakes, but um, I go to work with Kenny and you got to remember you, the millennials, it's hard for them to realize that there was no technology. We didn't have smartphones, computers, laptops, iPhones. I remember when we got an automatic garage door opener, that was like the second, the greatest technology that ever happened was um, the remote control. Because, you know, if you're a kid, you're the remote control. Your dad's like, Hey, change that to channel 10. No, change it back to three. No, get back. It's like, I mean, you're just running back and forth from TV. And then if there was bad weather, you had to stand there and hold the rabbit ears because for some reason, when you grab the antennas, uh, you got better reception. So I can't tell you how many shows I watched while standing behind the television holding the receptors. But, but Kenny Anderson, oh, my God, he'd take an X-ray right through the tooth. We'd go into the dark room, develop the x-ray, and then he'd go in there and he'd do a root canal or a crown. And it was the highest, it was the closest I could get for, to walking on the moon. I mean, it just blew my mind. And I wrote my dental school letter in the sixth grade and Diane Beard got the letter and I, I had told her, what do I have to do to become a dentist? I really, really, really want to be a dentist. And she told me to go to high school and take science classes. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, hell, I was in the sixth grade. There's no career plan to dentistry starting that young. I mean, wow, it, was, so it was just, I, so I'd say it was Kenny Anderson, the technology, um, the owning your own building. You know, um, when I was at Creighton, my career counselor said, well, if, you know, if you want to be a dentist, why don't you want to be anything else? And he <laughs> said, have you ever thought about being a physician? I said, no. And so we started talking. I realized that a dental office was very close to a dermatologist's office, to an ophthalmologist's What I didn't want to do is have anything to do with a hospital because I know that's like a university. It's big politics and you got to be golfing with the head guy or lose privileges. I didn't want any of that complicated stuff. And then I realized that if I can become a dentist, a dermatologist, an ophthalmologist, same thing. They own their land. They own their building. They have a small staff. 
and they kind of have their own kingdom. So my career counselor, uh, Father McGloin, made me apply to uh, Creighton Med School too, and I got accepted to med school, I think from one joke. Uh, during the interview, the physician said, uh, well, why do you want to become a, uh, why do you want to go to Creighton Med School? I said, well, I, I don't want to go to Creighton Med School. I want to go to Creighton Dental School. And he goes, well, Howard, you shouldn't say that during a damn interview. And I said, oh, I'm going to tell you the truth. And he said, well, um, why did you apply to med school? And I said, Father McGuane made me, and it's just a backup plan. And he goes, don't ever say that during an interview. <laughs> and he, he said, if you were going to be a physician, what kind of physician would you be? And here I was in, you know, in college with acne all over my face. And I said, well, I want to be a dermatologist because every time I look in the mirror, I think God's giving me a sign. And the guy <laughs> cracked up laughing so bad. He goes, look, you're not even going to come here. You don't want to come here. I'm going to accept you. Worst case scenario, get out of here. And he was <laughs> laughing when I left the room. And um, I, I just wanted that one thing. I think it was uh, Kenny Anderson's uh, um, unbelievable self as a human. I think that it was, I mean, um, his... Uh, I just loved everything about it. And I love my dad 10 times more, but I just couldn't see myself making chili cheese dogs my whole life. And, yeah. and, and also what I liked about, den about dentistry is you learn in about five minutes. You know, my two older sisters are nuns and not to get into religion or anything like that, but all, all religion or all God really means is that there's, there's something bigger than you. I mean, a supernova is bigger than you. A, the, the, a black hole is bigger than you. I mean, um, you know, um, something's bigger than you. And I, and what I took away the most in dentistry is that when I started getting interested in dentistry, I realized that if I gave my whole life to this girl, I mean, hell, there's 12 specialties, oral surgery, endo, perio, pediatric dentistry, orthodontics, cross science, dental anesthesiology, oral facial pain, oral med, oral path, oral radiology, dental public health. You could, you could study this. 12 hours a day, seven days a week from birth to a hundred and die and still not know half of it. Wow. And it's, it's bigger than you. And it's really fun and humbling to be a part of something that's bigger than you. Kind of, kind of like that real estate university you do. I mean, yeah, you're a real estate agent, you're successful, you're making money, but you know what? Real estate's bigger than you. And you know that, and you're already thinking about your replacement that when you get old, retire, and die. Well, some other kid's going to follow you. And real estate, life, you know, have, being a part of something bigger than you is just really damn cool. Hmm. So that was the motivation kind of. You, you saw something bigger than you. You saw what your dad did, but like you said, you don't want to make chili cheese dogs for the rest of your life. And it's there, all you can really Dennis get on Street, Dentistry was bigger than a chili cheese dog. <laughs> <laughs> which ironically chili cheese dogs cause the need for dentistry if you think about it <laughs> yeah okay so um and then when like you know from there i mean what what kind of happened when did you go into you know start making money and, and realize that you have a knack for this I and mean, what what did that look like um what i what i learned in dentistry is you know i um i um Became a dentist, I, all that stuff, and I realized um, my dad's first and biggest mistake, dentistry hadn't even reached yet. And that is, so my dad and his two buddies had delivered bread at Rainbow Bread. It, I think it was Jerry Sellers and, I need to ask my mom about it. Jerry Sellers, I know for sure. And I think the other one was Cliff White. Um, but anyway, they decided they were going to open up their own restaurant. And they went to Kingman, a city outside of Wichita, Kingman, Arizona, and they set up a Circle 3 restaurant, an RV park thing. So you could park your RV, have a restaurant, the whole nine yards. And in one year, they lost all their money and it, it, was, it, was, it went out of business. And then they realized they didn't give up. And they sat there and they realized that if you open up your own restaurant, the first one or two years, 20, 40, 50% of them go out of business. I think they got an 80% five-year mortality rate. But franchises are the opposite. 10 years later, 98% of them are still going strong in the United States of America on these McDonald's and, and Burger King and KFC and all these things of that. So he realized that the business of burgers was, was bigger and tougher than making a burger. So he bought that Sonic Drive-In franchise and my, um, my two older sisters went straight to the nunnery after high school. So if I stayed home with my five sisters, it was all religion and novenas. And like, 
<laughs> every day was a patron saint of somebody. Like yesterday was the the patrons of the Immaculate Heart of Conception Day. Every day was a special day, a holy day, something, whatever. And um, but when I went to work, my dad, it was none of that. It was all customers and employees and cheeseburgers and french fries. And it was just, it was just so different and it was so exciting. And the franchise required you to do all these continued education, all these classes, and you'd go and there'd be a binder. My mom and my sister didn't want to have anything to do with that. So I went to all these lectures and classes with my dad and we'd get a binder and we'd sit up there and we'd learn all these things that I was so young and dumb. I thought this applied to fast food. I was going to go be a dentist. I was just doing it with my dad and learning and have fun. So then I sit there and I'm, I'm about to senior year of dental school and I realize, oh my God, these dentists, they don't do any demographics for their location. They just go wherever the hell they want to go. They don't know what any demographics mean. I'll say, well, your dad's a dentist. He's been practicing 30 years. What is the median household income? What? Um, and then I go to his dad's, my roommate. I mean, I live in a house with five guys and one of them's uh, George Rui. His uh, dad was uh, George Rui Sr. was a dentist and his grandfather, George Rui III, was a dentist. And I, I'd say to his dad, I'd say, okay, um, um, you were just in this room for one hour and you did two fillings. Um, how much revenue were the two fillings? What was the cost of the room? And how much net income did you make after taxes? And he just like looked at me and laughed. He goes, I don't, I don't have any idea as he ran into the next room. Because if you just worked hard and hustled and keep, you know, it would all work out in the deal. But I, I realized these dentists don't do anything, anything that a Long John Silvers would do. And they still don't, it's 2020. Dentists are sitting there wondering why DSOs are taking off. And I mean, uh, the DSOs, you know, they have a different dentist every day. Um, the dentists that work there, they, they don't even stay a year. Um, the, the staff, they, they, they hire a bunch of temp agency staff. I mean, they just do every single thing wrong on the human relationship level, but they're kicking dentists ass. Why? They got the best locations, the best equipment, the best marketing. Everything in business, they get an A, just a solid straight A on their report card. Everything done at the human level. Um, like I know Dennis that, um, you know, we went to school for eight years because, you know, if you're a fireman and you say, well, I, all I want to do is check sprinklers. I'm like, why the hell did you become a fireman? Most, most people that set their aims on fireman, they want to pull up to a house engulfed in flames knowing there's some little old lady trapped in the basement and they're going to go get her a policeman wants to literally run down the sidewalk and body tackle a bad guy and uh, my gosh these uh you know they just didn't know um you know they they they, they um my, my my deal is when you come in the office and you couldn't sleep last night and you're holding your face and you have to keep drinking ice water because only something cold on your tooth will stop the pain. And I'm like, God, that's why I went to school eight years. I, I can do that. I can get you in the chair. I can get you numb. I can pull that tooth. I can do that. That's, that's my five alarm fire. And I'm all excited about that. And the dentist will work for HMO and you know, someone's coming in and they're in a hard way and they lost their job. They're in the middle of a pandemic. They're coming in for a crown, uh, but the whole area is going to be numb. And you have like a little cavity behind them, a little cavity in front. They say, you know what, Austin, um, don't worry about it. I'm not going to charge you. I know, I know you're in tough time. I'm going to do that filling in front of that tooth and behind it for free because I'm already here. And then the DSO is like, no, you can't do that. We don't do free dentistry. You have to charge two fifty. dollars and, and you know, and that's not even why the dentist went to school. And, you know, they can't keep their doctors. They can't keep their assistants. They can't keep all that stuff. And that's the stuff uh, I learned in franchise. That's what I learned at Sonic Driving. You get the best demographics. You build the best team. You get HR. You do the interviews. Um, the reason my dad wanted the girls to roller skate to the car window was not because that was going to do anything. But my God, if you're so damn crazy that you're that you'll take the risk of roller skating to a car window with a plate of drinks and french fries without dropping it he knew he had the right attitude he knew if you were the girl that took a spill out the middle of 12 cars on each side everybody'd get out of their car and run and help you and i mean they'd probably eat the french fries off the ground i mean it was all about people time and money and so i realized in dental school it's like my gosh this has not come to dentistry and and also we got we got to go back even further um 
at that time, um, it was illegal in the United States up until 1973 for doctors, physicians, and lawyers to advertise. It was against the law. Wow. Two lawyers from this, uh, from Tucson, Arizona, had to go all the way to the Supreme Court just to get them to, to back off that law. Den when I got out of school in 87, Dennis still thought advertising was taboo. If you talked about money, I remember the first time I had a really big day and I netted a thousand dollars one day. I called home thinking my dad had answer, mom answered. I told my mom, I said, Mom, I made a thousand dollars today. And there was just dead silence. And she goes, Howie, that's gross. You're you're a dentist. You should tell me you got someone out of pain. You <laughs> fix someone's tooth. You don't sit there and say you made a thousand dollars. I mean, it was just taboo to have business, finance, money. It was all this kind of stuff like that. And uh, so, um, the bottom line is um, um, that that was a journey. So, when I was a senior in dental school, I wrote the Department of Economic Security because I knew. I didn't want to live in Wichita, Kansas anymore because my mom uh, brainwashed me. Her brother lived in Phoenix. And every time I ever watch the news, the meteorologist would show Kansas and it'd be like a sad cloud with snow and rain and drizzle. And then my mom would hit me on the shoulder and go, Howie, look at Phoenix. Look where my brother lives. And there'd be a happy sunshine face with stars. And so I knew when I was 10 years old, I was going to go where the happy sunshine guy lived, not where the sad cloud lived. And, um, but once you're willing to leave your home, then you're really willing to go anywhere. Like you're in Florida. I mean that, you know, where, where do I want to go? So I was a senior in dental school. So I wrote the, the Washington DC department of economic security. And I say, what, what was the job outlook for the future? And they said between 85 and 2000, I say to create 30 million new jobs and half of them would be in five towns. They would be in, um, um, Tampa, Boston, Phoenix, Silicon Valley in Orange County. And Boston was just as cold as Wichita. I actually didn't, I, I, I hate to, I'm going to tell you the truth because I'm just dumb that way. I have some kind of weird filter on my brain that doesn't exist. But Florida, we took a family vacation to Florida and we went to Disney World and we left all the sliding glass doors open. It's all cool and breezy and fun. Woke up in the morning with like 8 million flying insects all over the walls. <laughs> and then we went and visited the Sonic Drive-In franchise guys and he had his whole back porch screened in and my mom's like my god this state's got flying pterodactyls everywhere you look and so i thought you know that florida's way too many insects and this is the part i'm embarrassed about i literally was afraid of california because when you grow up in kansas holly weird is just a bowl of nuts and flakes and i just thought everybody was just crazy <laughs> out there and then here's phoenix where my uncle chick lives and it's uh 65 of the people came from the northern midwest where i thought all the normal people lived and and so then i switched to phoenix and i wrote to their department of economic security and they sent me um the 70 80 85 mini census the six-year road expansion the six-year water pipe expansion which is very important in the desert and so i um in dental school i got a six foot by four foot map of phoenix i traced out the 303 census tracts. I wrote the Arizona State Board of Dental Examiners. They gave me a, the name and list of address of all the dentists. I put a uh, uh, white pen for endodontist, green for periodontist, blue for oral surgical, orange for orthodontist, black for dentist. And I had so, and then I got index cards. And for every zip code deal, I just, all I was trying to figure out is how many dentists for how many thousands of people and what was their median income? And that was about a three month project. You kids on an iPad could probably do that in a couple that's of hours. What, I know we're on audio, but on visual, I mean, that's what this map is behind us. I and mean, what you described is, is what we do. And it's exactly what we see a, a lack in the market. I mean, and so doing that is exact, you're doing the exact right things way ahead of, way ahead of time. I mean, that's so awesome to hear. And, and, and right now only the DSOs are doing it. There's no individual practice doing that. I mean, you, you walk up to any, I, I, I'll, get it, I'll bet you a million dollars cash and I have a million in my checking account. I, I, I'll, I'll do the bet. We'll go, we'll randomly pick a dentist in Orlando. We'll walk in there and we'll just ask him like, what is your break even point for the day? I, and, and if he answers it, I'll give, I'll give you up my money in my car. <laughs> if, if, he, if he got done doing any dental procedure, I said, dude, you just did a root canal. You've done 10,000 root canals. What did it cost and how much did you 
Yeah, and what was the cost of it? What did you charge and what was your net income? And he'll say, well, I charged a thousand dollars. He doesn't even know he signed up for 12 different insurance plans and is selling this root canal for 12 different prices anywhere from like $300 to 600. I'm like, dude, you, you do that. You sell this for 12 different prices while not even knowing the cost of your root canal. Mm. I mean, I mean, and, and, and you know, they all have, they all work 16 hours a day. They all work Monday through Thursday. They don't work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They've had the same staff for five years. So you could just take all their bills paid for last month divided by the 32 hours are open. So, so all their bills cost, you know, 10 bucks or let's say, you know, whatever, a thousand bucks and they were open uh, 32, 64, 120 hours. And then they got three rooms. So, you know, I could sit there and say, well, just the average operatory in this office costs $150 an hour. And, 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 um, and here's your, I, it's just, it's just completely insane. It's, it'd be like you doing a real estate deal and you say, okay, you ready to buy? Yeah. Um, what am I buying it for? Oh, Austin, you and your damn details. <laughs> What's the interest rate? Oh my God. What are you, a conspiracy theorist? Uh, when, when, where's the contract? Dude, it's word of mouth. We're family. <laughs> and you, you don't even know the price. You don't even know what he bought it for. I mean, it's just like, and that's how non-competitive healthcare is. And here's something that Dennis don't want to talk about. You know why it's non-competitive? Why? Because I'm out here in Arizona where a fourth of the land is Indian Reservation. And um, we're right on the border of Mexico. I'm across street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation. There's 20,000 Mexicans born in Mexico living in there. And if you come up and you're a qualified dentist from Mexico and go to Guadalupe where there's not one single dental office in the whole damn city and you open up your dental office and start doing dentistry just like they do at Muller City. If you go to Yuma and cross the border, there's 20 of the greatest dentists in North America all there doing dentistry. And if one of them comes up and starts practicing in Arizona, the police will arrest him. Remember how your mom told you not to kidnap people and put them in your car and, and handcuff, you know? Yeah. Um, they, they arrest them, they handcuff them, they put them in a cage, they take them before the government and the government says, show me your paperwork. You don't have the right paperwork. And then they put them in jail or deport them. So you're in a, when you're a doctor in America, you don't have to compete against Nissan and Honda and Toyota, because what, what they want you to believe is this, no healthcare is better than someone that's not licensed from an American dental school. I, when I got to school in 87, there were a bunch of older Germans who fled Nazi Germany for some really obvious reasons because they were going to get murdered. And they got here and the United States said, well, no, we don't accept your dental school. You went to to dental school in Germany where they make Mercedes Benz, buddy, this is America. We make Chryslers and Pontiacs. Just don't back up the Pontiac because if you hit something, it'll blow up. And you wouldn't accept German dentists from Germany fleeing Adolf and give them a break. So what they do is their nationalism and their borders keeps all the competition out so that if you're dumber than a rock, no no business skills, have no numbers, have nothing to write home about to grandma, you're going to make $150,000 a year from age 25 to 65. If you're the dumbest lawyer, doctor, physician in all of Florida, you probably made $150,000 last year because there's no competition. And they'll never tell you that. I mean, because what competition does is makes you work harder. Like if you, when you were a wakeboarder, if you had to, if you had to go into competition against me, you would probably show up with a beer in your hand laughing and win. But if it was like, if it was like, who's, who's that redheaded, uh, wake, uh, who's that wet redheaded Sean, snow? Sean White is a snowboarder. Yeah. Yeah. You're a wakeboarder. He's a snowboarder. But if you had to go against him, he's not a wakeboarder. He's a snowboarder, but I bet you'd start doubling I down you, on your training. I bet, pretty good. I bet, I bet pretty you, good. I bet you'd increase your exercise and diet and you, you'd probably get in the zone for probably six weeks before you had to go against this guy, just because you say, okay, I'm wakey snow, but he, he's a maniac. So, right. so every time an industry passes tariffs, imagine, um, um, my gosh, uh, by the way, I love uh, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because you got our old 
uh, Arizona Cardinals coach, Bruce Harris. And I love Bruce. My God, I love that guy. So I love the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just for Bruce. But imagine if um, uh, when you put up tariffs, if you went up to Bruce and you said, um, yeah, Bruce, um, that player over there, yeah, we're just going to bench him for five years and put up protective barriers and tariffs so nobody can compete. And then after five years, look, look what happened to Mike Tyson after he had to go to jail for five years. He was unstoppable in boxing. But a five-year stint in an Indiana prison, and he came out, he was no longer on the cutting edge, and he, he lost his window. And that's what happens. When you protect companies with barriers and trade barriers and all that kind of stuff, the industry always dies because competition is something you have to fight on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can never take – it's like working out. What, how long do you have to get off your workout schedule before you realize, man, that was way too long of a break, and now you're spending several days just to get in the back to where you were before you took a break? What's the longest workout break that you'll take? Well, I, I just mix it up, um, you know, and back when I was um, wakeboarding, I, you know, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't take a break from working out ever. I would stop wakeboarding for maybe four weeks would be about the longest I would go. Uh, but during that time, I'd be doing cross training. So I don't know if that answers that question or not. Well, yeah, but how many, how many days would you go where you just said, I'm not going to run, walk, ride a bike. I'm going to do nothing but sit down and just eat cheeseburgers and watch TV. I don't know if I ever, if I ever. Yeah, see, see, but, but people, but people have been practicing dentistry for a century. They've been practicing dentistry and medicine where nobody can come here from another country. They put up so many economic barriers to entry. And then the Americans are like, well, all these people can't afford healthcare. Yeah, because nobody can from Mexico can go practice in Guadalupe or nobody from Tijuana can go up to LA. Uh, and, and so, so the government breaks the entire, entire system and then says well the only way we can fix it is you let the guys who completely broke the system and now we're going to make some national health care system it's like my god before they did that nobody ever needed help paying for health care until they started all these state boards and blocking out all competition nobody there's not one dentist from india that could move here tomorrow and start doing dentistry in a town that doesn't have a dentist, 11% of the towns in the, in the Midwest, 11%, 11 out of every 100 towns doesn't have one dentist. And they're like, oh, what is the problem? The problem is the state board not letting anyone in. So we're getting off tag, but the, the bottom line is you got to look at economics and business and dentistry. You got to look at it from 100 years back and 100 miles above. You know, you got to be looking at it from the moon going back 100 years of G.B. Black, 200 years of Pierre Fouchard. And once you start seeing the big picture, you understand macroeconomics. Then you understand what's broken in dentistry, what's going to be a great investment in real estate, where this train is heading. My mom used to tell me something that's kind of weird and creepy, but it's so true. She says, Howie, my dad always say, don't ever do anything unless you don't want to see it on the front page of the Wichita Eagle and Beacon tomorrow. So what the hell were you and John Lee doing last night? And uh, my gosh, uh, uh, would would you be would you and John be good with that being on the front of the paper? And that made you think. And my mom would always say, you know, when you go to bed at night and you pull up those blankets, you know everyone's gonna die someday. That blanket's gonna be closing the casket, and it's all over. Where do you want to be on that last day? Let's just make it easy math. You live to be a hundred. It's the last day. It's over. Where do you want to be? Well, if you know where you want to be a hundred years from now, you know right now whether you should go left, right, up, down. You, you, if you know where you're going, you're probably going to get there. But you have no idea what you're going. And that, that's what I see with so many people in business. Like, like they'll come up to me and they'll say, well, I sold cars for five years. And then I sold real estate for five years. And, and then I became a carpenter for five years. And now I'm going to be a mechanic. For, I mean, it's like, dude. It takes 10 years to master something. And in the last 20 years, you've gone four different directions for five years each. Let's try to get a plan. The only plan that I had right is from sixth grade to this second, I, I've only been going in one dental direction. I've never got off the dental path. Now, I might be doing all kinds of different stuff in dentistry, but it's all in dentistry. Mm. That is, that is impressive. That is a long time. 
to have your eye set on the prize. Absolutely. So um, you're a, you have the real estate university. Can I tell you the story about the um, time I got my real estate license? Yeah, absolutely. So I got out of school and by the way, I had my dental office open while living in an apartment and I had my, um, you know, I, you know, you know, when you see someone and they're like, if you go to Guadalupe, most of the floors are dirt floors. And a lot of times when I'm over there, you know, Rick, Ricky wants to go show you his $30,000 low rider. And I'm sitting there thinking, why do you have a $30,000 low rider when you live in a house with a dirt floor? And then I'd say, Ricky, look, um, you're only getting this low rider because you're trying to get Maria's attention, okay? Well, Maria doesn't want a low rider. She wants a man with benefits, especially dental benefits, not low rider benefits. And if you'd sell this $30,000 low rider and go to DeVry University for like 18 months, they're going to get you a high tech job at Intel, Motorola, whatever. And then instead of making $10 an hour cash under the table doing construction, you're going to be making $25, $30 an hour above the table with dental benefits. And when you tell Maria that you got dental benefits, she's going to get in your go-kart, your moped. She'll walk with you to where <laughs> you're going. You don't need a low rider. Well, the same thing dentists do. They go and they go, um, they go get a job as an employee somewhere else. And then they go buy a $340,000 home where they own the home. And I'm like, so you own your home and you don't own the means of your production. So you're a dentist. So when you're an employee and anything goes south, you're just, you're just chicken soup, man. They just, oh man, business turned down. You're fired. When you own your means of production, you can sit there and say, well, we used to be open Monday through Thursday, eight to four. Uh, now I <coughs> am open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week and um, you know you you have to own your means of production I don't care if you lease the building that you own your means of production but if you don't own your means of production I don't know you're, we're not having this conversation because I'm talking to owner operators I'm not talking to employees you know, um, maintenance people. I mean, that, that's, that's not my, my market. I mean, you're a dentist and you need to own your means of production. And um, so many of these people don't own their means of production. But finally, after I own my office, and by the way, I got in my office, no money down. I went to the landlord. It was um, Dave Cheatham. And I said, I want to rent this space. The demographics are perfect for me. He said, it's uh, $15 a square foot per year on a three-year lease. I'm not going any lower. I said, all right, well, I'll pay you $20 a square foot instead of 15 for five years instead of three. And he says, what am I doing with all that extra money? He says, you're going to do my build out. So he said, okay, that's a deal. I'll do the deal. It's only a thousand square feet. We already built this 16 acre Walgreens, KFC, Pizza Hut, Chase Bank. I mean, what the hell's a thousand square foot dental office? And then I went to the people sell dental equipment, Health Go out of Dallas, which then got swallowed up in an IPO with uh, Patterson out of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I picked out all the new equipment and it was the same price as my student loans, about $87,000. He goes, okay, here it all is. And we need $87,000. I go, dude, I don't have a flipping dime. So what I want you to do is sell me, the, bust that up over 60 months. And we'll do a pay to own. And when I pay the last one, um, um, I own it. And he goes, well, I don't want to do that. I, I know you don't want to do that. I, I know you, you'd like it $80,000 in Benjamins and cash under the table. I know that, but do you want all of nothing or do you want part of something? And so he reluctantly did it. So I got in my dental office with no money down. And, and, and I learned that off a TV deal. And I can remember sitting in my uh, house with five guys in our dental school class and this commercial, some real estate guy on TV telling you to send them an, um, an envelope with a check in it for this much money and tell you how to buy real estate, no money down. And my friends, my roommates are like, oh, that guy's an asshole. That's a scam. That's a joke. And I said, well, there's got to be something to it. I mean, you're probably right about everything, except there's got to be something. I learned that from him. And um, so then I got in there and um, I sit there and after my business was going and everything, I realized, okay, this is, I'm spending all my money and all my credit and all my debt. It's all on business. I'm doing everything right, but it's time to get a house and I want to make a baby and all that stuff. And uh, so I went and I um, um, 
looked at the sign of this house and I called the real estate breaker and he uh, showed me the house and he made me feel so stupid. I panicked. He says, well, you know, um, you know, it's the, the closing cost is three points and the interest rate's 14%. But if you put 1.5 down, I can get you down to two. And anyway, he gave me the whole spill and I'm just listening and I didn't know anything he was saying. <laughs> So I went back and I thought, oh my God, I'm so dumb. Now I realize that dentists talk this way to their patients 24 hours a day. Uh, yes, uh, Austin, you have an interproximal lesion on number three. It's causing irreversible pulpitis. We need to do endodontic therapy, then a full cast restoration, then a full coverage. Austin, do you have any questions? And Austin's like, I don't even know what one word you said. <laughs> so I panicked. I knew nothing. I didn't know I was with the, with the dumbest real estate agent in Phoenix that could have talked English. So I signed up for the Scottsdale School of Real Estate. It was three nights a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, six to 10 for six weeks. Learned all this stuff and about halfway through the course, I'm just sitting there thinking, somebody needs to slap that guy. Why didn't he just say, bing, 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 bing? Why? I mean, I'm a dentist, I can do a root canal and you can't explain to me like I'm five years old how to buy a house, really? I can explain to you why you need a root canal. Why, but anyway, so I got my real estate's license just because a guy talked to me like a dentist would talk to every single patient. He talked right over my head. I knew nothing what's going on. And, uh, but I want, I, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Um, the, <laughs> the one question that's never going to go away for a hundred million years, every damn kid gets out of school and he says, I was born in Tyler, Texas. I'm going back to Tyler, Texas. My mama lives in Tyler, Texas, but I don't want to pay rent from age 25 to 65. I want to own my own place. And then he finds out that everybody says, well, the best place to go, there's this new grocery store, a, a big H grocery store, or Walmart center, and everybody in town goes to this parking lot at least once a week in Tyler, Texas, where the Walmart, the ice cream store, all that stuff like that. And he said, yeah, but I, I'm not going to go sign a lease in there. I'm not going to go rent there. I found me a building and it's, uh, you just go down to the last road and turn on the dirt road then walk across the creek and have two camels and a horse. And, uh, and now I own my own. So should they rent or should they own? Yeah. And that's a great question. It, it comes up a lot actually. Um, and it, really the answer is that it depends. And so, but, um, I hate that answer. So I'll elaborate <laughs> because what it depends on is several things. You know, first of all, I think that the location is more important itself than whether or not you're going to rent and buy. So in this example of this guy who is dead set on buying, he's just taking the wrong approach because you can invest in real estate and it doesn't have to be connected to your business because now you're not really diversifying your risk because the value of the building is based on the tenant paying rent and that tenant is you, you're the business. So therefore, if your business takes a hit, your real estate also takes a hit and you don't really have diversification in that sense because it takes a long time to pay off these buildings. And second of all, you really need like the, the ROI on real estate when you own the business, when you own the real estate, you know, can be nine to 11% like long term, you know, um, sometimes higher, sometimes less. Like it's, it's good, right? But chances are you're going to get a lot higher ROI in your business. And so are you really, is it really worth it to you to take that hit? It's just so you can own the real estate, so you're not wasting your money. Now, are you wasting your money on rent? I mean, it, no, it's not going to equity in the building. But if it's a good spot, like the one you mentioned, next to the grocery store, people go there once a week. The demographics are very strong. There's high visibility, high foot traffic. Well, you're not really wasting your money. You're pay like there's a reason that rent costs money because it has value, and so you are paying for the value that you're getting in return. And they're really two different strategies. So. I hope that makes sense. First and foremost, like go to the location, right? Now, let's assume that all things are equal. Let's assume that there is a building that you can either buy and all the demographics are great. And let's assume that there's a building that you can rent and all the demographics are great. Now, this probably won't happen very often, but let's just say that it does. At that stage, you have to ask yourself, what am I going to do with the money in either situation? Because we're all, every business is constrained by the amount of capital that they have, right? Every single one. Uh, and so what are you going to do if you're going to buy real estate? That means that you have to allocate some capital. I mean, you'll be able to leverage your money. You'll be able to take on um, bank debt, right? Unless you did what you did where you don't have any um, down payment because you're doing a seller financing deal, which those are always sweet, but they're few and far between, but those are sweet. 
So let's assume that you're gonna have to come up with a down payment. Well, is that money better spent on real estate or is it better spent on your business or on your practice or somewhere else, right? And so we are proponents of owning real estate, but just not always when it's tied to directly to your business. So like, let's just say if, they're, if these buildings are not like, anchor tenant buildings or empty buildings, but they're in good retail plazas, but you're, it's a standalone building, right? Well, the value of that building is going to be driven by you as a tenant and the rent that you pay. And so um, you're kind of disincentivized to pay lower rent to an extent because then the value of the building goes down in case you ever want to sell it. So what it comes down to, like the distinguishing factor, I think is do, how many locations do you want to open? And if you want to open a single location and this is your dream and you want to stay here, then it makes a little bit more sense to allocate your capital towards the real estate because you're not going to be growing your business at the same rate as something somebody such as a DSO. But if you're planning on opening a second location or a third location, then you're going to need to get that money from somewhere. And chances are, if you spend it on the real estate, you're going to have a lot less to do buying the business. And usually your business will return, you know, 30%, 40%, 50% annually a return on, on the investment versus Real estate, you know, you're looking at a little bit less of, you know, nine to ten percent. Now, there are more complex strategies. Like, for instance, you could buy the building yourself, sign a lease to yourself, dry, which in turn drives up the value of the building, and then you could sell it immediately right after you sign the lease, and then you could use that money to buy more practices. But it, yeah, it really just depends on the operator and what their long-term plan is. You know, that was the best quality succinct answer ever i mean i got an mba from asu and you explain it better than anybody at asu so i gotta ask you another question um so uh, do, can i ask another question oh yeah 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 of course um so um i'm 58 um i um i was born in 62 that was the flash crash that was a bad year for the stock market i graduated from high school in i, 80. I was born in 87 so it was like black monday 87 so we got that in common and that when I graduated from dental school, I graduated dental school May 11, 87, right. and a couple hundred and a hundred days later was um, Black Third Black Monday, uh, where the market fell 25 percent in one day. And uh, so, 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 so I graduated high school in '80, and that was um, when uh, Paul Volcker raised interest rates to 21 percent. Unemployment and inflation was both double digit. It was the worst I'd ever seen. I had three friends whose dad lost the family farm who walk into the barn and off themselves. It was, it was the worst ever. Then 87, I graduate in dental school and get rewarded with black, black Monday. And then the Y2K, um, you know, when NASDAQ went from 5,800 to 1,800 and, and, you know, it's crazy. And then 10 years ago is Lehman's Day. So I, I, from high school graduation today, I've lived through four booms and bust. Wow. And I'm telling you that um, they're about 10 years apart. I mean, this just reeks of bust. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, right now, um, whenever you go to buy a house in a healthy market, they're asking $300,000. You offer them two ninety. dollars when people start saying, well, they're asking 300, you better, you better offer 310 or 320 or you won't get it. I mean, it's like a lottery. Everybody's bidding up the price to have the luck of the opportunity to be a slave laborer to a, a debt service for three decades. I mean, you know, crazy. Um, the other things are is the, the Buffett indicator. I went to Creighton University in Omaha. That's where Warren Buffett is. He really liked the business guy, so he came over to the school and he talked about the Buffett Index where he says, okay, look, within a country, the United States, you have the GDP, the total gross domestic product. Let's say it's $20 trillion. Well, you know that the value of all the publicly traded companies, I mean, 85% of the companies are all small business, 25 employees or less, whatever. So the, the, the few publicly traded companies that are maybe 10 or 15% of the economy, they can't be worth more than the entire damn G gross domestic product. So if the GDP is a dollar, the, the value of the stock should be about 70% or less. And it should be about six times year's earnings. Go back to the Irish diaspora. I'm all Irish. We trace ourselves back to the diaspora. When the Irish couldn't afford to come here, they go over and they say, Hey, Austin, let's pretend that you're, uh, you kind of look like Bono. We'll just pretend you're uh, from U2, you're Bono, and you're Irish. And we say, hey, Austin, we know you can't afford to go to the States. 
we'll move you to the States, but you'll be my indentured servant for six years. And you say, yeah, I'll work on your farm for six years for free to get the hell out of this potato famine. Well, what if I said to you, well, Austin, no, 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 not six years. I mean, right now, if I buy Tesla, it's trading at 100 years, 100 times price earnings. So if I bought this share for a dollar, it's only going to give me back a penny a year. So it'll take 100 years. So Austin, here's the deal. You're stuck in Ireland. There's a potato famine. You come with me. I'll take you to America. But you got to work 100 years for free. For the ride, you'd say, well, why the hell don't I just die here in Ireland? Then? I mean, and, and, and right now, the Buffett index is 181%. So the little Ru Russell 2000 publicly traded stocks is worth 181% of America's gross domestic product. Anytime it's got over 110, 120, 130, the market's overpriced, you start selling. And now they're not only selling, they're breaking new highs every day. I, I think their goal is to get to like a 200 year price earnings. I mean, it's completely insane. It's been 10 years that Warren Buffett says the, 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 the um, Berkshire uh, index is the most reliable thing he's ever had. Um, they're bidding up the prices of sales. It's been 10 years since Lehman, which was 10 years since Y2K, which was 10 years since Black Monday, which was 10 years since 1980. Um, I, I, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's a damn duck. Uh, but you can't predict the future. If I said, if I said this is absolutely going to happen, now I'm a palm reader. No one can read the future. I'm not a palm reader. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But I'm asking you, Austin Hare, does this market look like Black Monday to you? Does this look like we're in some strange times where the math doesn't add up and and this market could change directions rapidly? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you know, there's really three separate but related components. I mean, number one is the stock market, and that's always the first indicator. It's, it's a future indicator of what's going to happen. And then the res residential real estate market is usually lagging behind a little bit. And then behind that, the last is the commercial real estate. So if you look back to the past economic recession, you know, it was uh, 2008, it really started to veer down. And mid-2009, the stocks hit bottom and it started to recover after that. It wasn't until 2011 that we saw the bottom of the residential real estate market. And it was even after that when we saw the commercial market. So, you know, the, the stocks are trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. And when we had all this bad news and we had, um, you know, we didn't have a vaccine, everything was shutting down. The, uh, the Fed still had, was charging a little bit of interest rates. We just saw it go down, 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 down. And then um, at one point, the S&P 500, when is that trading at 220 or the SPY? it was less than the cost of all the assets, right? Like it wasn't even trading on multiple of earnings at that, at that stage. That's what I, I heard at least. And so um, obviously it's worth more than that, right? And so then what happened was we started getting good news. The Fed lowered the interest rates. They saw they were gonna throw the kitchen sink at it. And they realized like, oh, I think the, a lot of the institutional investors realized like, hey, we're gonna get through this. And there's a little bit of optimism. And so that's when you started seeing it go back up. And it went back up way before the economy went back up. I mean, people were always, thinking like, oh, this is going to correct, this is going to correct, this is going to correct. And everybody who would have tried to short the market back anytime after March 21st would have been dead wrong, would have lost their shirt. And so, um, you know, I think that when we look at it from a aspect of the, of the fundamentals of the company, that it, we're scratching our heads sitting here thinking like, this doesn't make any sense. Because I think we really moved far away from the fundamentals. And now, Honestly, a lot of it is tied to the technicals, Un unfortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it. Because like the one, th there's several things that I, I think are really playing into it. One is the helicopter money, right? Like, I mean, every single person got $1,200 unless you're making more than 75,000, which in that case you have expendable income anyways. And that's going to introduce a lot of people to the stock market, right? Like a lot of people that are, are like playing these option games and, and just really making the market do crazy things. Then you've got the unemployment. And so there is a lot of liquidity that's been thrown around. And even the fact that a lot of these big companies got bailouts from the government or they got help from the government. I mean, a lot of this money got redirected into the market. And so it kind of helps stave off inflation like a little bit because it's not so, so liquid. People aren't spending it on goods and stuff, but they are putting that in the market. And so there is like an inflation of, of the market. Now, the reason that I personally don't believe we're in a bubble or we're going to pop is just because 
we have so much money in the fixed income markets right now and in the bond markets, right? And, and when they lower the interest rates, I mean, you're talking like sub 1% annual returns. And so there's a lot of money in there. And then you're looking at the returns that you're getting in the equity markets and they're just insane. I mean, you, you can't even compare them. I mean, it's almost 30%, like a year over year in the S&P or, or, I mean, you know, I don't know the actual figures out pulling them up, but it's been a really, really good return. Yet alone if you're in other companies like, you know, obviously Tesla is an outlier, but a lot of companies doing really, really well. And so it's just like, um, as long as there, there's all that money in the bond market, making you almost nothing, uh, you know, I don't think that the equity market's overbought yet because I think there's going to be money that's going to be shifting over more and more. And it's not really, you know, looking at it through the lens of like Tesla is at 1300 times earnings, you know, that's insane. So obviously there's something else going on. I think it's the fact that what other people, you know, it's just worth what other people are, are willing to pay. And I know that like in the past we've gotten, um, you got burned this way, like the 1929 recession was caused by over speculation and, and over leverage. But I don't know if people are necessarily over, -le like they're not leveraging themselves to get into the stock market. They're simply just getting into the market. And so we got, you know, there's in a country of 320 million people where most of the population gets $1,200. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of liquidity that could potentially get injected into the market. So like, like you said, I don't want to go on record saying that I predict that this is what's going to happen because then people are going to be pointing out at you. But um, like personally, that's what I believe. I mean, I've been investing a lot in the market. I, I am optimistic about what's going to happen for those reasons. And then in the commercial real estate world, I think it's just going to be a shakeup. So it's what the ironic part is you think about the death of retail that's really been talking about lately, which is only true in some industries, right? Because and, and dental, for example, like dental is not dying. The coronavirus is not going to wipe out dental and they want to be in a retail location. So more than the death of retail, it's more like the transition of retail. So um, a lot of these retail stores like clothing stores or whatever are, are going to be facing trouble and restaurants are going to be facing trouble and bars are going to be facing trouble. And they obviously take up prominent retail spots. And so um, what happens ironically is that when a retail shopping store goes under or they no longer use that store or they switch to e-commerce, which a lot of them are doing, the footprint, physical footprint required to do business, rank an order gets bigger because of all the different levels of the supply chain. So if, you know, some Abercrombie and Fitch, you know, uh, shuts down their retail store and people start buying it online, well, they actually require more physical retail space along the supply chain in warehousing space or in, um, you know, industrial space. And so Amazon is just buying up so much real estate right now. They are causing, so while you see the retail, um, not, it hasn't really been going down yet because there's been government policy, government incentives in place, but the, that, the demand for the warehouse has gone up. Like warehouse and industrial space has actually gone up because of Amazon, because of the rise of e-commerce driving that. And so in one situation, you know, there's a Sears in Orlando that's going out of business because they've been hit hard, obviously, right? And so like they are prominent retail spots and retail has always been the most expensive real estate that you can possibly get your hands on. And it's such a big spot and it's the demand has gotten so low, like the demand has gotten low for that while the increased demand of uh, industrial space that they're actually looking at buying that location because they can get it cheaper than they could get <laughs> in a, an industrial uh, location for and so I think you're going to see like a massive, a massive shift um, in what does that mean in particular for dentists is keep your eyes out, keep your eyes peeled for spots that you want to go to because if the restaurant goes under or, you know, because of the lockdowns and the closures or whatever, um, then you, you know, you're not, they're not going to be increasing the price at the rate that they have been increasing the price of these grade A locations and you might be able to get yourself a spot. So, you know, there's several, there's like the A locations, there's, B uh, retail locations, you have C, you have D all the way down. And it's kind of like a little bit of a muddy scale. Like, you know, it's not like you physically, um, it's like a sliding scale, right? You, you can um, be subjective in how you classify those terms. But um, I think the D level and the C level are going to really, they probably will get hit a lot. But if you're in an A level retail market, I mean, people always want to be in the best spot. And um, so I think that while we may see a dip, I think 21 in 21, you know, we might see some buildings start to open up for like a, a pretty good price. So I'd be optimistic about that. But I don't know that it's going to shift enough to create a crash simply because of the other factors that are increasing. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, what do you think? I, I, you're so damn smart. I love listening to you, man. <laughs> I 
swear to God, this was a uh, love at first sight for me. I can ask you another question. Yes, um, of course. So in my lifetime, um, you know, I was classically trained as an MBA at ASU and in Phoenix. Um, is, Intel had a big factor, Andy Grove. Andy Grove um, made the best predictions with his 10X model where he said, because they'd always say, how does Intel always pick the next great technology before everyone else? And Andy told everybody, there's no secret, he said, look, when we're looking at RAM technology, DRAM technology, MicroPro, whatever, and there's all these players, we track their cells meticulously every quarter, and it's a horse race. But we don't know why or what or whatever, but if any horse ever jumps out 10x or more in a quarter, they, uh, they always won the race. And we might not know why was it, price, this, whatever the hell, something happened and that's the winner. And I see a 10x change in TAS, um, transportation as a service. I mean, when you look at the cars, I mean, it's kind of like dental offices. See, I don't think anybody should ever build another dental office again for the next 20 years because there's 150,000 general dentists, um, 30,000 specialists, there's about 210,000 dentists in about 180,000 locations, and they're all open 32 hours a week out of 168 hours a week. So they're closed about 81% of the time for the 30, for the 29, 19% uh, of the time you're open, and cars are 4%. So you got all these cars, and 96% of the time it's in the garage, the driveway, the whatever. And I live in Phoenix, so I'm biased. That's where. Google started Waymo and I have the Waymo app and they did a five year autonomous driving program and it was so successful. They just ordered 80,000 more autonomous driverless cars and the average person saves $6,900 a year because number one, they don't need their parking lot. Now your, your garage at home can now be your man cave and you put a pool table out there and a big screen TV. You don't need a garage for your car that doesn't move 96% of the time. And um, you save $6,900 a year on gas and maintenance and tires and batteries and depreciation. I mean, you don't need, you didn't need a horse. I, you remember, if you go back far enough, the number one problem in New York City was they couldn't haul out all the horse shit on, on what, I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. I mean, they, they, they could not haul the horse manure out of Manhattan faster than the horse's poop. And everybody said, well, they're Americans. They're never going to get rid of their horse. I don't know anybody that lives on a horse. And I live in the equestrian center. And the girls that do, it's always a girl, and it's before she gets a car. And then the minute dad gets her a car, the horse is lonely and they sell it because it's just something girls want before they get a car. But the bottom line is, Americans don't want a car over, and quit calling it 69, I'll just call it seven grand. If you walked up to someone and said, I swear to God, you pull out your iPhone, you call it driverless car. You know, one thing they don't like about Uber is that, that, that humans don't like other humans. They don't want to get in a car with a stranger and, and, and you know, blah, blah. But when it's a driverless car, you can go out there in your pajamas and your, and your robe. You're just going through the drive through a Taco Bell at midnight or whatever the hell uh, you're going through. Okay, I'll admit I'm Irish. It's uh, the, uh, the drive through liquor store at midnight. <laughs> um, you know, you don't have to bathe, brush your teeth, shower. You can just be in your underwear uh, on the way to the drive through liquor store. And it's $6,900 cheaper. So I'm wondering about, does a dentist even need to have a good location? Because you need a good location if you're driving by the store. If everything, you know, they said 100 years ago, if you're not seen from the horse's trail, you don't exist. And that's why you go into any one of those small towns, the, right on the main drag is the saloon, the hotel, the bar, everything's on the main drag. And I'm starting to think, everything's about to become end destination. I'm going to say, I got a dental appointment. I'm just going to type in Austin hair and then, then Waymo driverless car. They're going to drive me straight to the thing. And then you start looking at that. And then you look at Phoenix, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona has enough parking spaces that's bigger than the city limits of San Francisco. So we have a whole city within Phoenix that's just parking lots, garages. And, and so my question to you is, is this gonna be something that my grandchildren, my, my, my boys are 30, 28, 26, 24, 
My my six grandkids are from um, 13 to, I can't believe one is a teenager, 13 to, to a month old. Is it is TAS transportation as a service, is that here now or is it just bleeding ads and it's not real now and it's not going to have any impact in the next 10 years? Or is this what's driving Tesla? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely what's driving Tesla to answer your question. I mean, it, you know, the... 1300 times earnings is, is absolutely insane if you thought that's where it's going to stay. Obviously, people think, investors think that something exponential is going to happen. And the only thing really at this stage, I mean, he has a gigafactory, of course, in China, and that was all big news. But it's being able to develop a robotaxi network is all what it's hinged on. So there's a lot of bullish sentiment in that area. I mean, I personally have a Tesla and I love it. <laughs> and that's what got me interested in the stock. Now, from firsthand experience, you know, I have the full self-driving package. It's a long ways away from actually being full self-driving. It's great and it's very safe when, um, you know, you get a notification on your phone or something like that. But to fully be able to take over the self-driving um, and transport people around like they want to do, I mean, you know, there's a lot of complicated things that go into driving that you just don't think about until like you're there behind the wheel and you're watching this car try and make these split second decisions that you've taken for granted because you, you've been making them for so long as a driver. So um, I, I, yeah, I think absolutely it's, it's inevitable that that's going to happen. And so the question I don't think is whether or not it'll happen. I think the question is when, and you know, let's just, you've mentioned 10 years as, as the time frame. So um, that will be relatively soon in my opinion. I think it might be later, but even if it is 10 years, I mean, what are you going to do in those 10 years? Because if you picked a location that was off the, the beaten path, because you were anticipating driverless you know transportation well you might be kind of suffering for 10 years before they actually make that transition and and you might miss out on a lot of that revenue you know what i mean a lot of that um visibility and so am i like i'm if i just knowing my very small limited um knowledge a little bit of research and and the, from the car that i drive i think it's still like you know at least at least 15, if not, if not more years away by the time we get mass adaptation. But um, another thing too is like, you know, what I would be considering is just, even if we do get to that stage or, or when we get to that stage, you know, does that eliminate the need for the fundamentals in site selection? Like you talked about earlier, like when you planted it all out on the graph, because, you know, I think there's still a cost to taking a, an autonomous taxi somewhere. And so are you going to want to consolidate your trip. So will there still be a benefit to being next to the grocery store? You know, that would be my main question. So I want to ask you a question and I wish you would get on Dental Town and answer this question. If you, I mean, Dennis, there's two things you can know about every dentist without meeting them. They love golf and they love real estate. I mean, this guy, this guy writes under um, finance, personal finance. He says, how did you acquire your first rental property? Would someone please share their story? All my friends, every dentist I know, and their mother have a rental property. So the temptation is high. It's killing me. There is no decent rental property that can be acquired, blah, 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 blah. But um, my gosh, will you promise me? Um, um, number one, I my theory is, you know why they like golf and they like um, real estate? Because why golf, golf, you can't talk. I mean, they're... <laughs> Dentists aren't stressed out doing a root canal. They're stressed out by their patients and their staff. And they just, you know, they, in order to get straight A's in math, physics, chemistry, and biology, you got to sit in a quiet library for like eight years and get A's. And that's not the type of person that just came back from, you know, the class king prom night, you know. I mean, you, you, could, you could spot a business major versus a dental student from a block away because the business major had a beer in one hand and a hot blonde in the other. And the dentist had a geometry book and a trig book and was looking for the library. And um, they, so they, they love golf. There's no talking on the golf course. You know, they, there's no talking. They like real estate houses can't talk, but all the dentists are always here. Here's your question. And it, it's my, my um, final question. I don't even know if you can answer it. They're torn because they got $400,000 of student loans. So they think, well, I should be paying down my student loans. But then there's a $400,000 rental property duplex, a deal, and every dentist has a rental property. And they're like, 
they're like, God dang, man. Um, so here's the question, Austin. Should I just pay down my $400,000 student loans or should I buy a $400,000 rental property? Well, what is the average rate on the interest for the student loans? Oh my gosh, uh, they can be, they're all over the board. They can be low one or two or 3% government loans. They can be five, eight, nine percent heel loans it depends on how desperate you are <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i mean you know to me it's just math. usually they max out all the cheap low government stuff so they they max out on all the the cheap good student loans but to get to the end of med school dent school they took out all that they could on the high-end interest rate loans yeah yeah i mean you know i think it, it's just math uh personally um you know like I like when I look when it comes out to just the house that I own, you know, it's a 3% interest rate. And um, there, is, and I still have some debt left on the house been paying it over 30 years. And then, you know, there's also a, a trading account. It's like a it allows you to convert your money back and forth between cryptocurrency. A lot of details, long story short, they pay 8% interest, right? And so um, with the money, that I currently have, let's just say, like I have exactly the amount of money that I need to pay off my house and I could live mortgage free, which sounds amazing, right? So to use round, round numbers, like maybe it's, maybe you owe 200 grand on your house and the interest rate is 3% and you have $200,000 in your bank account. Well, is the best thing to do, put that money in your, uh, towards your house to where you can pay it off because you can save 3% interest or is it to put it in an account where you get an 8% return on your money? In that scenario, I would always recommend to put it in an account, keep the debt, keep the debt on the real estate, that's a lower interest rate, and put it into something that gives you a higher rate of return because now you've spread 5%. You know what I mean? It's the exact same money. You've done nothing different. You've just made a smarter decision about it, and you're making 5% more on your money because the interest rate is better. So like, to me, when it comes down to should I pay off my student debt or should I go buy a rental property, well, which one is going to return you higher money? Like, if, you, if your interest rates on your student debt are 16%, and you're going to go buy a property that's going to return you 8% annually, I would pay off the debt. You know what I mean? But usually you can take out debt on like real estate is just super, super cheap. I mean, there's hardly anywhere where you can get a 3% annual, like 3% rate over a long period like that. I mean, it just makes the payment so small. So it's very easy to make more money than it costs you. And um, so, yeah, I, like that would be kind of my rule of thumb is like, Hey, put it down on the spreadsheet, you know, figure out what you're going to, um, what's going to cost you and what it's going to net you. But like, if you're, if your debt is less, you know, is on the lower side, like, like you mentioned, one to 2%, I would be holding that debt all day. I wouldn't do it. I would try and pay it off as slow as possible. So I could take all my cash, all my liquidity and putting it into things that are getting me much higher return because there's a lot of options. There's a lot of safe options that are going to get you a higher return than one or 2%. Okay. Um, on the real estate thread, Dennis is asking. Uh, first of all, I love your answer, and that was a beautiful answer. It the, the math, it's math, dude. It's a math answer. Your bookkeeper, your spreadsheet. I mean, th this is a math answer. Do the math. Exactly, exactly. They always, but they're saying they, they want to diversify. They would like to have a passive income, and they're like, well, isn't stocks and bonds passive income? But do you consider real estate passive income? I don't. Yeah, I don't consider real estate passive income at all. And I did a podcast on this too. It's like the three options for your money. You know, hold it in cash. Oh my God, if I send you the link, will you post that podcast in this, uh, in, in this thread? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, you can hold all your money in cash, like save, 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 save. And I think that's the worst thing to do because of inflation. You're going to pay the inflation tax of 3% or more every year compounding all the way till it's worth nothing, right? The second option is, is real estate. There's a lot of different things you can do. And then the third option is the stock market. That's very overly simplified but you know with real estate i think that residential real estate is a, a good investment can be a good investment but um you know this whole thing of like tossing around passive income i think is completely overplayed because when you buy a residential real estate property you are not buying a passive income stream you are buying yourself a small business <laughs> you know and especially if it's a single property like you are the maintenance guy you know like unless unless you get a whole bunch of properties you're not just going to hire a full-time maintenance guy you're going to at least have to do one making the call to the maintenance guy, which a lot of people take for granted, you know? And so, um, you know, by the time you spread your, you've got your fixed expenses, which yes, of course your mortgage is one. Um, but 
what about like all the capital expenditures? A lot of people just don't, they just think optimistically, it's like, oh, well, my mortgage is X, my rent collection is Y, so I'm gonna be making Z. Well, like you're gonna have these random expenses that come up all the time, and usually it really eats into your profit more than you realize. And so you're appreciating the house, so it usually works out well over time. But you know, if, you're, if your mortgage payment is 1200 and your rent collection is 1500 that sounds good, right? Your $300 a month um, is a pretty good percentage. Percentage-wise, it's pretty good, right? But you're looking at $3,600 a year. And if they call you for something twice a month or once a month, or you got to look for a new tenant once a year, I mean, how much time have you just put into this for $3,600? You know, like, especially as a dentist, you can make that, in, it, like you said earlier, three days. And so I think you've got to be really careful about your time in these situations. And so just, you know, one, one thing that people can do is a REIT, like a real estate investment trust. It's a publicly traded stock that you can buy. And that truly is passive. And I'm not saying that non-passive is a bad thing. I'm just saying you got to be prepared for the amount of time that it's going to cost you. Okay. I want to, I want to get your words right. So you would say stocks and bonds are passive income. Or yeah. Is that true? Yep, stocks but, and bonds. I would I would classify those as passive because you can you can sit back and do absolutely nothing. You do you don't have to take a phone call. But, real estate, but in your words, but real estate is not passive income and is a small business. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, um, and I you, you know yeah, um, and here's another thing um, when dentists have to go in and do dentistry every day, you know every week the rest of their life to live they it starts playing with their mind and they get burned out but when they start diversifying and as soon as they realize oh my god i i don't have to be a dentist anymore then they love dentistry <laughs> and it's humans if if you have to do it you have you get a bad attitude and if you don't have to do it and then you're sitting at home and you're bored and you're like well, I'm bored and I don't know what to do. And you're like, well, I know what you want to do. Go do that thing that you like to do. And then they're happy. And I just hope, I just wish um, dentists um, would not um, just never get caught uh, where you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It is cool. It is, it is funny. And Tony Robbins talks a lot about that. Um, you know, and I'm, I know you had him as a guest on your show, which is absolutely amazing that you did that. Um, cause well, I, it, it's I, only, it's only because I asked, <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's only because I asked if you ask, I, and, and furthermore, and he's a good example because what would Tony Robbins rather be doing sitting on the couch, drinking a beer, watching the, uh, what's the Thursday night football game? Uh, what, what's the game tonight? Oh, tonight, uh, I have to look at the Rams. Oh, uh, that's a good game, but okay. That's a bad example. I can't say, would he rather be watching the Patriots and Rams, but you know, if you called up Tony Robbins and said, hey, Tony, you want to come rant to my, my homies? He's like, well, I mean, there's not many things you'd rather do. And that's what you need to do. You need to stay in there. And by the way, I'm going to send you this, um, this thread. I wish um, I'm going to send you this. Um, I'm going to send you, I'm going to email you two threads because I, I know when something's a problem when it gets to, um, um, how, how many um, replies does this one have? This one has, um, um, what it, it was, oh, 1,600 replies. Wow. And when, when you get to 1,600 replies, that's Latin for you couldn't get all the dentists to agree that today is Thursday, okay? <laughs> and uh, they're just like that. And uh, so I just sent you, um, how do you, how did you acquire your first rental property? You got to podcast that and uh, the passive income thread. And I'm all for the passive income thread. Because like I say, um, what's weird about dentistry that I don't know, I don't know if Austin's ever had to experience this before, but um, when you're a dentist, everyone that comes in says, oh God, I hate going to And you're like, oh, nice to see you. And then, you know, they didn't do anything right. I mean, they didn't breath. You know, you know, at the end of World War II, half of America smoked. And now only 20% of America smoked. So since World War II, half the country uh, that smoke now only 20% of the smoke. Well, the other half didn't start flossing. I mean, you say it's so hard to start, stop smoking. It must be harder to start flossing because more people stopped smoking than ever started flossing. 
and everybody comes in and the first thing they say is, oh, I hate being here, I hate going here. And you're like, well, nice to see you, Austin. How may I help you? Well, I hate you and I don't floss. And will you hold my Mountain Dew while I show you which tooth hurts? I, and, I floss for the record. I Did you floss for the record? <laughs> Yeah, so it's a, it's a weird country we live in that more people have stopped smoking than have started flossing. Funny. Is that just the weirdest damn thing? Uh, but, um, man, I could listen to you forever. I really could. And, um, um, and again, I really hope someday um, you start posting on Dental Town because, uh, God yeah, dang. Gonna, uh, this is my motivation to do it right now. You know, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to turn it into a habit. That's my goal, to continually just be on there and, and network with people. All right, my man. Yeah. Well, so, you have any so, other questions for me? Or yeah, am I, 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 uh, honestly, I have a ton of questions, but we just we went so long. Um, I want to, uh, unfortunately, have other things scheduled. I want to give our listeners a break to let some of this stuff digest. But yeah, I think, um, you know, in the future, I, I love your story about the real estate. And um, I would love to also get the full rundown on, you know, you had Tony Robbins, you had Grant Cardone, I and mean, you had some amazing speakers on your podcast, but I think we might just have to maybe reschedule for it, you know, second. Yeah, hell yeah, man. Look, anytime you want, you got my email, Howard at dentaltown.com, and um, you got um, Kevin Kyle Johnson Jones email. Did I say your name right, Kevin? It's one of, uh, yeah, you got Kyle's email, you got mine. Hey, you ever want to do it again, man? It's an honor. Um, you're a brainiac. I love uh, <laughs> listening to you. Uh, thanks for all you do. Well, the feelings yeah. mutual. I, I appreciate the kind words, but yeah, I love listening to your stories as well. And I love anybody that can get a dentist out of the head game of, I have to go drill, fill and bill Monday through Thursday to five where I can't pay my bills. And then he starts being self-destructive. And the minute he's debt-free, his kids are gone and he's got passive income. It's just like me. You know why I didn't sell my dental office when I could have? Because then I would have to go in my house and make one of the rooms a dental chair that I need a compressor and an x-ray machine and, I don't know how to take an x-ray or turn on the x-ray. I have to have a dental assistant. And the reason I would never get rid of my dental office, because when my little grandkid breaks a tooth and I go to the dental office, I mean, I, I, you know, I got, I got, I'm a dentist. I have to have a dental office. And uh, so when you're debt free, it's a hobby. You'll never quit doing. It's like, when, when will you quit riding bikes and wakeboarding? Right. Yeah. Just, it's just fun. Yeah, it's just fun, and if when you, you're and even when dentists retire, they're still a damn dentist, and uh, you know. Actually, yeah, with with wakeboarding, it um, I I always loved it, but the impact just got too high. You know, I was 29, and I was losing to 19 year olds. <laughs> so I decided, oh man, this is not for me. But I still had the competitive drive. I still loved pushing myself, and so me and my wife got into like Ninja Warrior workouts about a year ago, and so that's shifted my focus and, and allow me to keep my competitive drive going at the same time. So I well, you ought to have the Ninja Warrior dentist come on your show. Do you know her? No. Who's that? Email me a uh, Ninja Warrior dentist. I'll, I'll fix you up with her. Oh my God. She's a dental office and her every room is a different exercise. So let's say you're in room one, she's going in there to do a root canal, but it's got a chin up bar and, and she walks across the deal. Uh, go to uh, dentistry uncensored and put in Ninja. Okay. And, uh, but uh, but anyway, if you can't find her, let her know. But she's the okay. coolest damn ninja warrior dentist. Should I send you, I send you an email about it or just go on di uh, dental town? Just, just send me an email, then I'll reply to you with her email and cell phone and text and all that stuff. And that was, That's so funny. Yeah, I had no idea. I would love to talk to her. <laughs> and then tell her that I'm your ninja warner, a uh, ninja warrior um, um, trainer, and she'll be all <laughs> like, gosh, she'll be thinking you're like some 600 year old. She'll think you're Job of the Hutt or something. She's like, Howard, your personal trainer? Uh, Holy funny. shit, you must be more bound. But anyway, uh, great talking to you, man. You ever want to do it again, just let us know. Yeah, all right, Howard. Likewise, man. Right. Thanks for coming on the show. We'll talk to you soon.